honored to be up here today with Kitty Gilbert, uh, who wrote this beautiful book, Southern Cooking Global Flavors. Um, we're going to spend a few minutes talking through a recipe, talking about uh, chef stuff, and and uh, hopefully kind of uh, have you all walk away with some understanding of what the intention behind this book is, and, and have Kitty share his story, um, which is really uh, fascinating and really fun. Um, and so, yeah, thank you for being here, Chef. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah. Uh, so, so, so both Kenny and I have a, have a somewhat similar background um, in that um, we, have, we're, we both have moms from the South. Uh, my mother, we have a restaurant here in town called Olame. Um, it's right over here. <laughs> uh, and, and Olame is my mother's name. Uh, my grandmother's name, my great, my great, great grandmother's name. Um, they're all from Tennessee. Um, and Chef's mother, where's your mother from, Chef? St. Augustine, Florida. And and throughout the book, he talks about how his mother uh, was was basically the the reason you got into cooking, right? That's right. So uh, growing up in uh, Cleveland, Ohio, uh, I was like three years old, kind of just running around the house. Uh, my mom, you know, was a clothes designer. You know, she was kind of a tailor working on a fashion show. My brother was in a playpen. You know, he's like a year and a half younger than me. So they're downstairs in the basement. And the way the story goes is I was running around the house and she had a pot roast uh, in, the, in the oven. And for whatever reason, like I was, I decided to go to this oven door and open it up and then grab the towel that was on the, on the outside of that oven door because I'm paying attention to what she normally does. And you remember back in the day, they used to have these towels that always had the little phrase on the bottom, you know. Well, I went ahead and pulled this rack out, and then the phrase hit the coils um, and started to smoke. I then ran downstairs. I'm looking at my mom, and then she's like, what did this boy just do, you know? <laughs> and then she ran upstairs, and then she saw what I had done, and then she op took, took the lid off the pot roast, and the pot roast happened to be done. And then so from that point on, she said that she was going to teach me the, the ins and outs of the kitchen. And so the very next day, uh, she had a little step stool, and she's, you know, and she's just a great, amazing human being, but just a great teacher. She saw something that I had an interest in, and so she started showing my, me a way, you know, my ways around the kitchen. So I started off by scrambling eggs. She showed me, she, you know, she made sure she, I understood at that young of an age, like, do not come in here and do anything when mommy or daddy's not in here. Um, and like these are hot. And so she like literally let me feel certain areas, understand like this is not good. This is a no. This is okay. Clean as you go. And she just nurtured that in me for a long time. So uh, I was very fortunate that I just, I mean, going to the grocery store, I just remember uh, she would, you know, allowance, I was allowed to buy different things as I was getting older, like, you know, whatever I bought that I would be able to take home and actually practice with. And so for years, because I was so young, it was a lot of eggs cooking, you know? <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, not that expensive, you know? And then we had all these different spices. And so I learned what, what was really good with eggs and what was not. <laughs> like, like rosemary, not so much, you know what I mean? Like, I mean, what an advantage though. I mean, egg cookery is like the hardest thing to do. Yeah, so man. getting the start there is awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so I, I, I was very fortunate. My, uh, I was, my, I just did an event in, um, in Ohio at the Chef's Garden, and, uh, and I had an opportunity for my daughter and my mom to be there with one of my best friends, and we did this beautiful, you know, sold-out dinner on a Friday night, and to see the expression on my mom's face when we had this sold-out group of people and hearing me talk about the food, it was a, it was a moment that, you know, a lot of times, you know, it, you know, you, you know, people, you know, you're, you're born, you know, there's life and there's death, right? And we know, I know she's, she just turned 80. She's still a very young 80. Um, but like, I try to make sure that I celebrate her now versus when she's not here. And so to be able to celebrate her during that moment and my daughter and for them to see what I've been doing all these years of busting my butt was like, just kind of like, you know, thank you, Ma, for, for, for taking that time with me. Yeah. It's a real, it's a real honor. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Well, and and I think I think that uh, 
sounds your mom sounds a lot like my mom. I think my mom's amazing and, and so easy to talk to. And I, and I think that that using food like you're talking about your mom in this event and, and using food to, to connect people um, really feels to me like what this book is about. Hundred um, percent. I was a I was a swimmer and a diver growing up as a little kid. Like I swam wrecks and I, I lived in the pool and I was really good at it and. Um, you know, am I, you know, I was like one of the only black kids in the community that was really good sw swimming competitively. And so a lot of my friends, you know, up in Cleveland, you have all these different pockets of neighborhoods. You have, you know, you have Little Italy over here, and you have, you know, the area where, you know, a lot of the Orthodox Jewish, you know, communities over here, and then you have Little Croatia over here. And so like a lot of these, all these different kids were all on these teams, because the wreck was the place to go. And so all my friends, I would end up spending the night you know, or, or vice versa at our homes. And I would always immediately gravitate to the mom and then I would be in the kitchen helping the cook, you know what I mean? And so what I realized was when I would open up the refrigerator or open up the pantry, I was like, wow, like their stuff here is different than mine. And, and, that, and, it, and it didn't really 100% really connect until later on as I'm becoming a chef that I was really truly developing my palate um, and understanding the diversity of food through my friends and relationships, you know, because my one of my best friends is Italian. So like I talk about in the book where I remember like playing outside and coming in the house and then uh, opening the refrigerator door and they had this red bottle that actually had this Italian dressing in there. And I remember, and it may have been, it's like, she, I know, you know, Mrs. Ferrone made the, her own dressing and for, for, I never watched her make it, but as I understand it, she probably just had some a Zesties a zesty uh, you know, Italian dressing packet where she just had to add olive oil and vinegar, shake it up, and it was in a bottle. But I just knew that that was like the best dressing ever <laughs> for this sandwich with Genoa salami and provolone and a nice crusty Italian bread. So that was my experience of that. And so as I've gotten older, you know, working, you know, supporting the, 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 the local mom and pop restaurants, you know, when you have, you go to a Thai restaurant, you go to a Vietnamese restaurant, you go to a Chinese restaurant, Japanese, when someone opens up this restaurant, and, and I'm not talking like a chain, I'm talking like truly mom and pop, they're opening up themselves of their culture. They wanna bring something to the community that they feel is missing. And so those are the restaurants I really support. And I talk about this Thai restaurant in Jacksonville uh, named Pattaya Thai. And Lake and Russell, um, they had this restaurant for the better part of, of 25 plus years. And when I was doing fine dining, uh, working at the Ritz Carlton, on Sundays, I would, my restaurant was closed. I would go there, and uh, and I would just have dinner. And it's because it was something I didn't know about. I didn't, I you know, we didn't really have a lot of Thai restaurants that I ever even eaten in up in Ohio, you know. Um, and so that was really one of my first experiences. And she, every time I would go in there to eat, once she realized that I was a chef and whatnot, she would come out every time, and I would always go home with something. And she would say, hey, I just came back, and I got these, these really cool mangoes. This is this variety. Take it home and play with it. Hey, here's um, this uh, nak chong sauce. Here, go ahead and play around with this. And so she really trained me in understanding the culture and the food and the why. And she's probably invited me to go to Thailand with her at least a dozen times over the years. And, um, and now it's, she's getting older, so I was just talking to her son, Russell, the other day, and we're going to make that trip next year. Uh, together, but I would tell you, like um, I talk about in the book, that that's how I really have grown um, as a chef. It's not only being very fortunate by working for a Ritz Carlton company and them sending me all around the world, but also supporting the local restaurants and going in there and really eating and asking questions and, and building that relationship. And um, and so that's a tribute to this book. We really just took ten kind of iconic. I look at it as iconic southern dishes that I, reminds me of growing up as a kid, and then look at the, the flex on it, as in what are the other variations that you can do, whether it's celebrating the ingredient to do something different like we're going to do today, um, but it's, you know, or just adding other ingredients to the mix, like say chicken and biscuit chapter. Like, yeah, I have a great chicken and biscuit. It's a buttermilk drop biscuit, fried chicken breast cane syrup butter, so you get that nice cane syrup butter, so, you know, dripping on that chicken, you get that bite, it's amazing, right? You know, but I have a, a, a chicken parm version in there as well. So I show you how to make the biscuit properly, 
They were like, hey, now let's add some Asiago, let's add some basil, let's add a little crushed red, red, red pepper, some garlic, now let's make a homemade marinara sauce, now let's do a different style of fried chicken, let's do that with a standing breading procedure versus like your normal brine and buttermilk egg batter or, or whatever in a dredge. And so now we're showing like how we can take the humble chicken and biscuit that is, that is delicious, but then we can also make it where it makes sense for you know, and, uh, other cultural influences. Yeah, and I, and I think that at least before I became a professional cook, like that was really f an unnerving idea. Is like I needed to follow every recipe the way that it was written. And the book does such a great job of, of showing you very plainly these items are all the same but very different. And, and that is really exciting. Absolutely. So like today, um, I've been, you know, this is actually the last trip on my book tour. I've been doing this since the book came out April 11th. Um, I wrote it during COVID, uh, which was, you know, uh, a really challenging time, as we all know. Um, but I'm a very efficient kind of person. So like I have to be constantly doing a lot of different things. So uh, when I got with my co-author um, and, and my friend who's a, a photographer, we sat down, came up with a game plan, and we put it, we, we just put it into action. And so uh, every month, every other week, we would uh, work on either the head notes for the book uh, or uh, do the recipe testing and then do the photo shoot. So we did that over the course of 10 months. Uh, it took me about three months to do all the recipes. Um, I, would, I got up every morning for like two hours, like from five to seven, we'll work on recipes. And I, literally at seven, I would stop. And then I would just turn my brain off and then go and do whatever else I had to do. And then the next day, I would come up and just kind of finish where I left off. So we knocked it out in a year's time. Actually, a little bit under, like 11 months, we knocked it out. We shaved off a month just in the system we had in place. Um, and so we wanted to, uh, you know, I, I look back on it. I was like, man, I, I don't know if I would have been able to do it if it, that didn't happen at that time, you know, because it was... There's just a lot of uncertainty was going on, and I just, you know, we made we made use of our time. Yeah, uh, I don't know if everyone's aware, but cookbook writing takes a, a tremendous amount of time and energy. Um, most of the books that just do take take at least a year, um, and and I didn't know this until I started talking to my friends about it. Is that whatever businesses that you operate, you need to be able to make this book full time and do that, and so yeah. um, it's. It, it, anybody who's made a book, I admire, because <laughs> yeah. it's a real process. It's a real process. So we were, when we opened up, uh, I opened up my restaurant. Um, well, let me back up. I had two restaurants that were open, and my leases were coming up, and I was supposed to combine the two concepts. Because I had one, they were about forty, they were about an hour apart. I was like, okay, I need to just have one spot. It's kind of like when you go to a big city, you only have like one cheesecake factory, you only have one PF Chains. It's like I looked at it, I was kind of cannibalizing my brand because people were driving way from Jacksonville to go to Amelia Island and vice versa to go to the restaurants. I said, I need you to have one spot and put it all in one, have a big bar highlighting bourbon and moonshine and whiskey and, and just really fun. And so uh, I decided not to re renew my leases. I was like, oh, I got an opportunity to move to Raleigh to open up a concept. So it was a big deal. COVID hit. We we're on lockdown. That deal went south we decided to open up the, the restaurant in Jacksonville. And what, what, when we determined to do it, the restaurant is called Silky's Chicken and Champagne Bar. So it's all based on chicken, you know, fried chicken, artisanal biscuits, um, champagne cocktails. And what helped us get to that point was, you know, I've been very fortunate that one of my good friends was working for uh, Oprah Winfrey, um, you know, many years ago. And he basically brought me on to the team to help cooking for the holidays and things like that. So I've been cooking for her and her family since 2014. Um, and what, what, what helped me decide I was gonna do Silky's was one day she, you know, her assistant texted me and said, hey, Ms. Winfrey wants to talk to you. Um, she wants to see how you're doing or whatever. This is in October of 2020. Um, and I was trying to determine what concept I was gonna do in this particular space. And, um, and so my wife said, oh, we should, you should do your fine dining, because that was my background. Even though we had casual restaurants up to that point, she said, you should do fine dining, forget the casual market, cater to the top 5%. I was like, uh, no, I don't think I want to do that anymore. And then Ms. Winfrey called me up. So we got on the phone and she says, hey, Kenny, you know, this is O-Dub. And that's, that's what she calls herself, you know, around everyone that knows her. And then she was like, I'm here with Kirby and Will, you know, Gail's kids. I need you to sell this bet. When was the first time I had your chicken and biscuits? You know, I'm trying to tell them I didn't have it because I didn't want to, you know, 
indulge that particular holiday season because uh, you weren't gonna have me looking like you know me wearing a moo moo at the Oscars, <laughs> looking all crazy. And so that she, she's so funny, she jokes around, right? And so when I got off the phone, I looked at my wife. I said, "We're doing chicken and biscuits." And so I was like, and "So it just dropped out." She just called me randomly, and then was talking about the chicken and biscuits. So um, when I opened that restaurant, I knew I was working on this book, and and so I closed. I was only open five days a week. I set it up so I could have a balance and quality of life. It wasn't about making a ton of money. It was about living and living and loving life, uh, because again, COVID was teaching us all that. Hey, you know what? You know, you can be furloughed. You could have given yourself 25 years of this company. Furloughed, all of a sudden, oh, we're not bringing you back. I'm like, no, 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 no. I, I need to make it where my staff knows that I'm for them, they're with me, and, and we have a good balance. And then also, I wanted to make sure that I was going to be able to do this book. So Sunday and Monday, we were closed, and I would work that five-day work week, and then I would go into uh, going shopping on a Sunday, scaling all the ingredients out, then Monday coming in, and then as I'm preparing the dishes, my photographer is getting all the shots, we're styling everything. So like when you see the grit and everything in there, the, the cutting board, the knife, me cutting, it's like that's real. That's as I'm actually finishing that recipe, then you get the money shot of me actually playing it nice. We did all that at an eight hour shoot on a, on a, on a Monday. So we did that for over 10 months to get it all done. That's amazing. Way to go. Mark Thank you. So, so today, this, this salad, uh, I, I, we're actually doing this salad. We're doing a brunch tomorrow at Ola Bay uh, with Chef, um, which is very exciting. <laughs> um, and, and every year, it's a real honor for us to cook out of these books. And, and generally, what we do is, is we take inspiration from them. Uh, and so uh, we're effectively doing this salad tomorrow as well. Awesome. Yeah, so this is inspired by the, the chapter of collard greens and cornbread. Um, each, each chapter has about four or five different variations, the traditional and then four or five, you know, you know, interpretations. And so, again, I told that story about the Thai family because I love, like, a Thai green papaya salad. And so I want to be able to show some things in the, in the cookbook you're going to see that's, hey, here's that same biscuit. You're going to add this and add that to make it to this new version. Um, but I also wanted to show how you can take the ingredient and do something totally different. Um, so for example, this one, instead of making, instead of doing a nice fine julienne of green papaya, we did a nice fine julienne of, of collard greens, um, the substitute. So I'm gonna show you how, to, how we do that. Um, and then the, the corn, cornbread part of this, we basically are gonna do a coconut cornbread crepe. Okay, so it's like a Johnny cake um, in a sense. So think um, crepe that has that cornmeal, that cornbread flavor. So, I don't know, one of the things I remember about, you know, what I love about this particular chapter, the collard greens and cornbread, my dad would always, you know, get the ham hock out of the pot, have the collard greens, and then my mom would make a nice skillet cornbread and a cast iron skillet, and then watch him dip into that pot liquor and take that bite. That's what I, that's what I think about, you know, with these ingredients. And so, for me, the inspiration behind this dish is that I love that acidic uh, spice that's in the, the, green, the green papaya salad. And then, but now it becoming collard greens, I have this canvas of this crepe where you can kind of fold that salad in to get that bite. So the, is you still remember, you still kind of give you the nostalgia of the cornbread and the collards, but now it's giving you those flavor profiles of, of, of Thai. So I'm gonna jump into this. I've been talking a lot. <laughs> so um, the, uh, we're gonna start with the crepe. So I'm gonna get the crepe batter going. So we have some cornmeal, we have some uh, self-rising flour, uh, sugar, um, coconut oil, coconut milk, ground ginger, some salt, and some eggs. And so, you know, we're just gonna put everything right into this bowl. A lot of the recipes I set up in this book are, when you look at the procedures, I try to make it really simple. Everything that I did, the only, only pieces of equipment that you're gonna need is maybe a hand blender, a regular blender, um, your oven, your stove top, and like a grill outside. And then you can either use gas or you can use charcoal, or if you don't have that, we can talk about there's options for ovens, like if you end up doing like ribs or something like that. Um, so I try to make it really, very um, user friendly, where you didn't have to have like, you know, I didn't throw in thermal circulators and cryovat machines and all that, whereas a lot of people may already have that at home. 
because they're really more advanced, that's awesome. But I want to do this from a level of comfort. Uh, so, bless you. So, a couple of eggs. And depending on the fat content of your, your coconut milk, you may have to adjust this with a little bit of uh, water. So we'll see, this is it's kind of cool out, so it's kind of tight. Um, you will need a, um, a Teflon pan or, um, uh, or a nice cast iron pan that's nicely seasoned uh, for, in order to make this. So you just mix this all the way up. So this is a little, this is a hair tight. Not, not, not too crazy, but I'm just gonna add a little bit of water. And we already have our pan uh, heating up, but we're gonna mix this and kind of just let it set for a second before we start making the crepes. And then we're gonna go into the dressing. The, the other thing that I thought was great about the book, excuse me, um, was yes, not a lot of equipment, but also a key about ingredients so that if you're not familiar with something, here's what it is, here's where you can find it. Uh, it's really helpful. Yeah, so like the, um, so uh, Gregory Jordet, um, he wrote a cookbook. Um, and I remember we were cooking out for, cooking with Ms. Winfrey. And, um, and then he gave me the book as a gift. And I was like, man, this book is beautiful. And one of the things he did in his book, he had a really nice pantry list. And I wanted to make sure that as I was going through it and searching for these ingredients, that it was gonna be easy. Obviously, you know, Amazon has virtually anything. You know, you can literally, if you plan it out properly, you can literally, um, you know, go ahead on you know, your Amazon, put it in the, hey, this is what I need, it's at your house the next day or so, super easy. I like to, you know, I, one of the things I talk about in the book is that explore your local markets. If you've never been into an Asian you know, um, you know, grocery store, I, su I, I strongly suggest that you go, because when you go, you're gonna get turned on and hooked. For one, how inexpensive the product is. One, it's gonna save your bank. Two, the variety of ingredients that you're gonna find is actually amazing. You know, the, tom the tom tomatoes, the herbs, the fruits, some things you never had before. It's okay, if you never had dragon, you're like, what is this fruit? This is, oh, it's a dragon fruit. Buy it, take it home, cut it open, you know, have all the family try it. You know, expand your family's palate by trying different things. Um, and then that way, you know, because everything's so convenient. Oh, this is going on my app, it'll be there tomorrow. But, you know, like go around, walk the, walk the aisles. You know, when I was on Top Chef, uh, Kevin Spraga, uh, he ended up making it to the finals, and he had never really had gone into any, any Asian markets. And he was like, Kenny, we're, you know, the, 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 um, the, uh, the finals are going to be in uh, Singapore. He was like, you know, what am I going to do? I said, well, what I suggest you do is go to the, uh, your Asian market there in Philly and uh, walk around, go to one that's Korean, owned by you know, a Korean family, go to one that's owned by Vietnamese, go to one that's owned by you know, Thai, because they're all gonna support everyone, but they're gonna have more of one because of where they're coming from, right? That's why they open it, because they have a large community that's gonna support it. I said, get used to the aromas, you know, I said, grab, buy three types of fish sauce. Take it home, figure out which one you like. Incorporate it into your cooking. And, and he did that, and he came back, and I said, come up with some dishes. He came back, he did that, he ended up winning, you know, because of that suggestion. And I said, so I, said, I always tell everyone, you know, support your local grocery store, you know, and, and if it's something that you, know, you haven't done before or haven't been, it's okay, you know. Um, try it and you'll, you'll be surprised. So as you can see, as I was talking, I just put a th very thin layer of this batter down. And this is like a four ounce ladle because this is a larger uh, pan. In the, in, the, um, in, the, in the recipe, I think it says like an eight inch uh, Teflon pan. This is like a 10 inch pan. And so once you, because what happens is that fat, that coconut oil is, it, it gets cold. So as you can see, as soon as that, it gets hot, it starts to loosen up. And we're just kind of putting it around the outside of the pan just so that it can uh, get nice and thin. 
Is there is there a type of cornmeal that you like to work with? You know, I can go into my fine dining bag and be very specific. Yeah. But you're not gonna do it. You, you, know, you know what I mean? Like, you, you, you're not. I mean, but you know, um, there's a lot of great, you know, um, product out there. Um, was a Bob Mills. Um, yeah, Bob Mills. Bob Mills yeah. is great. That's you can find everywhere. Um, but um, you know, you might like Gold Medley. Maybe that's what you 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 grew up eating. You know, you know, uh, whatever your preference. You could do this with Jiffy's corn muffin mix, okay? You can add one egg, instead of adding milk, a quarter cup of milk, I remember that recipe from a kid, for that one box, right? Everyone knows it, yeah. you, know, you know, I'm not lying. Instead of doing um, regular milk, put in coconut milk, okay? Uh, thin it out a little bit more, you know, add a little bit of coconut oil to it, and you literally have everything ready to go. Like, literally, that's how easy it is, and so, I suggest that you make it from scratch. What you just, what you just saw, it was super easy. You add a little bit of ground ginger and it's ready to go. Um, and the cool thing is you can make this batter, keep it in a little deli container, um, and then uh, whenever you're ready to make it, you can make them up, or you can make all of them, and then layer them between parchment paper, wrap them up, and you can freeze them. And then when you're ready for it, you can pull it out, slap, put it in a microwave, or, or put it in a little pan just to kiss it to warm it up, and then it's exactly, it's a very user friendly. Actually, like a, there's, there's, there's companies that actually sell crepes already ready to go. They're already layered and frozen like that uh, just for, for the ease of it. So you can do the same thing too. Especially if you're planning for the holidays. No, nope, oh, yeah. I'm taking this for Thanksgiving, but you know, I'm really busy at work. You can, you can plan this ahead, okay? All right. So again, just one little flip. As you can see, it's not, not, not difficult. I got gloves on, but I would do this barehanded, but I'm just so used to wearing gloves. Um, it doesn't take that long. And you know, so you want to have your, this heat is just, looks like a medium heat. You don't want it screaming because you want, uh, you want to have a nice golden brown color, um, but you don't want to be like too, too dark. <coughs> um, all right, so we're gonna pull this last one off. All right, so now let's talk about the salad. Um, we already have some nice collard greens that were beautifully chiffonade. And I gotta say, I'm just gonna bring this up. I've been doing this for, I don't know, the last several months. And most places I go to, like they say, oh, chef, we'll have everything ready to go for your event. And I was like, well, just make sure that the collard greens are a nice chiffonade because if, if not, they're gonna be really hard to, to, to eat. And when I say chiffonade, Usually it applies to like herbs or basil or something like that. And so what you want to do, these are all like a lot of the inner leaves of the collards. Uh, you want to use those first. Uh, and the cool thing in this, in, this, um, in this cookbook, there's another chapter that has um, uh, in the collard greens and cornbreads where you actually t keep the stems and you kimchi the stems. And then you do like a, a kimchi soup that has beef short ribs, these uh, cornbread dumplings. It's awesome. So we're showing you how to utilize product. So from, that, from a waste standpoint, if you know that you're gonna work on this dish, and I tell everyone, read the entire book first. Read the entire book, and then when you decide to work on a chapter, you realize that some of the ingredients are gonna also cross into another. Um, so in this case, you've got, you get a big old bunch of collard greens, go ahead and get the, you can buy the kimchi base that you can buy when you're at the Asian market. Literally cut all those stems up, add the kimchi base, mix it together, you put in a little, you know, little uh, Ziploc bag or a mason jar, and then when you're ready to do that other recipe, it's gonna be good to go. Okay. Yeah. Um, so here we just what, the chiffonade. You just want to just take all these uh, these greens, you just roll them up into like a little bundle. So it actually it's a manageable uh, size, and then you just slice really thin. Now. By doing this, we don't really have to try to break down the collard greens that much because they're going to eat actually really, really nice. Um, and you can see you have a nice shipping out of collard greens. And you see they're, they're like exactly the same. So they, my point is they did a great job prepping these. <laughs> <laughs> nice work, Thank baby. you very much.
That's usually the only thing I'm worried about with this recipe. Everything else is like everybody gets it. And then, I, you know, I've gone to some places and they give me like big old chunks of already chopped green. I was like, you guys don't have any whole collard green leaves? And they're like, oh, we couldn't find any. I'm like, we're in the <laughs> South. Are you kidding me? Um, <laughs> Uh, so the dressing, there's um, really simple. Um, there's some garlic. Uh, we have some fish sauce. I like to use the fish sauce that actually has the, cr the three crabs. I think it's a little bit sweeter. Um, we have some uh, lime juice. Uh, we have some dried shrimp. We have some palm sugar or coconut sugar. And we have some uh, Thai bird chilies. Um, we're going to slice these up a little bit. The cool thing about this dressing, you can make this dressing, again, put it in a mason jar. I'm telling you, you'll enjoy this on rice. You know, you may make some, like a, like a little omelet that might have some veggies in there that you can use as a dressing to garnish it. It's a very, very craveable dressing. Um, and I, I absolutely love it. Um, so from there, we're just going to put this on a blender. I think, I think this is one of the most versatile vinaigrettes. What's that? Uh, one of the most versatile vinaigrettes out there. Yeah. It's got a little bit of umami from the fish sauce, uh, the sweetness, and then raw garlic has, uh, a, I think, a really lovely spiciness. Absolutely. It's, um, it's very, very fragrant. Um, and then so once you have this dressing ready to go, again, you can have that ready to go in, the, in a container. If you, you, know, you can stage this out over a couple of days. Um, the next thing we're going to do right now is just mix it. It's really simple. So we have, um, we have some tomatoes that we're going to go ahead and just kind of cut in half. Normally you would have this in a kind of a large wooden pestle mortar um, called a puck puck. And so they call it that because they're, like, it's puck puck, like it's pounding when you're macerating everything together. Um, it's not like the normal one that you would actually have that's, that, that's the Mexican pestle and mortar. It's not that heavy. It's, it's, a, it's a wood pestle and it's a big wooden, um, wooden bowl that's, that's kind of narrow. Um, but you don't have to macerate it that way. Um, I have one and, I, and for the recipe in the cookbook, I use that. But the way I'm doing it right now, you can usually do what I just did. We have the dressing, we have our tomatoes. Okay. Uh, we already have some peppers that are diced up. Um, we have some Thai basil. Okay. Um, and then we're going to take the greens. And so when we mix this up, what we're going to end up doing is we're going to kind of massage it with our hands. That's going to simulate using that, that pesto mortar. And we're going to add some peanuts. And then so what you want to do is just kind of just mix it up. So you can kind of crush the tomatoes when you bring it together. Kind of bruising the collards. You're kind of bruising the collards. But the great thing is, is it holds up really well. So you can make this. And then if you got a dinner party to go to, have your crepes already ready to go in one separate container, have a salad ready to go, bring your platter. Then you can go ahead and plate it all up, look, make it look really pretty when you get there. They're going to think you're like a, a rock star. And when they smell it, it's like, I, I, we did this in a huge pestle mortar at the chef's garden. I did, you know, did it the full way. And when everyone walked into that, that building, all they could smell was the, you know, the bird chilies and the dried shrimp and everything. And then so from here, we just kind of put it on the plate like so. And I tell you what, the, the sweetness of the tomatoes and the peppers is great. And then we garnish it up with some more beautiful Thai basil. And then some more peanuts. And then you garnish it with some limes. You know, that you can always just kind of squeeze a little more on top. And 
And that's it. Beautiful. That's your Thai collard green salad. So we have we have a few more minutes, about ten minutes. Um, I have some questions for Chef uh, that I want to ask, and, and if you guys have some questions, uh, we'll just kind of pepper them over the next ten minutes or so. Um, so start thinking about what your questions are if you don't have one. Um, so, uh, Chef, we also have a, a a chicken and a biscuit restaurant. It's called oh, yeah, it's called Little Ola's Biscuits. Okay, uh, and so. I, too, uh, have spent a lot of time around biscuits and, and talking and working with them. Um, but we use two very different styles. Okay. So you, you use a drop biscuit, and I use kind of more towards that laminate. fancy laminate stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, people always want to talk about biscuits. Yes. Uh, and always want to know what the tricks are and what, what your secrets are. And so... I always tell people uh, when I make biscuits, the, the key to a really great biscuit is having everything really cold. So I freeze all of my flour. I freeze. I put my buttermilk in the freezer. My butter is in the freezer before I grate it. I, and then when I mix, mix it, my hands want to be so cold. I want it to be so cold that my hands hurt. Um, that's what I tell people. What do you tell people when they're asking secrets? So when I'm doing a laminated biscuit, same. 100% the same. And so when I opened up uh, Silkies, um, I wanted to do a drop biscuit because they're not quite, they're, they're a little bit more forgiving. You know what I mean? You can pretty much mix, put everything together, mix it, scoop it, bake it, and they're gonna be great. Um, my brother, who I mentioned earlier, he's, he's a corporate chef for a, a Don Food Group out in LA, and he was corporate chef for a Cheesecake Factory for, gosh, five years. And so he was working with the pastry chef there, um, and we were talking biscuits. I was already open, I think, you know, almost, you know, probably ha half a year or something like that. And he was asking me how I did them. And so with a drop biscuit in the recipe, um, I show you how to make it by hand. I also show you how you, you can make it in a mixer, which you would think is, is like, well, you never want to do that because you don't want to develop the gluten in the biscuit. But when we're making, you know, like four different types of biscuits, 200 of each a day, you know what I mean? Like we have to have something to be able to get us, to get us to do it, you know, in a, in a high volume situation. So we we take our buttermilk, uh, we put it in the mixer first. Uh, we add and we melt butter, okay? Uh -huh. So we melt butter and then get it to a room temp, but where it's not so, super hard. We usually add that in with the buttermilk. We add some eggs. Um, a little bit of apple cider vinegar, uh -huh. um, and then um, and then we take in the um, we take uh, shortening, mix it with our flour. Um, we use self we use white lily self rising flour, um, and then and then sugar, and we use a little bit of xanthan. Okay, so we have our dry ingredients with a little bit of our shortening, and then we have our liquid ingredients, um, as in our buttermilk, our melted butter, the apple cider vinegar, and so we put in the bowl first the liquid, and then what happens is that buttermilk. Uh, and that, that butter, because it's room, it's now it's melted, but it's room temp. We mix it with that cold buttermilk, and then it becomes like almost like the, you see all these like the, the milk fat solids and everything in there ready to go. Then we add in the dry ingredients, and literally on speed one for for uh, for 45 seconds. Then we we do make sure there's a good scrape, but you don't really have to scrape it because you already had the liquid in the bottom of the bowl first. And then you do speed two for 30 seconds and then it's done. Wow. And then we scoop, um, and then we bake it 375 degrees for, um, for like 12 minutes, uh, depending on the size of the biscuit. We do, we do like a four ounce sandwich size biscuit, yeah. so we give a monster, and then we have a small one that we do as well. Yeah. For like, uh, we do almost like a, a, a charcuterie board where you have our four different types of biscuits, jams, pickles, and butters, and that way when you come in, you order that, it gets dropped down on the table, and, and then all, and the biscuits are cut in half, and we put them back in the oven and toast them off a little bit. So you get a little texture on the outside, and it's that caramelization on the inside, you just get all the fat, and then you're able to spread your butter and your jam on it. Because I was watching guests at first, I was just sending the biscuits out, and they're all trying to cut it. And I was just like, ah, you know, it's making a mess. And then they got kids out there, there's crumbs everywhere. <laughs> and, I was just, and I'm working out in the front of the line, I'm like, yo, like this is crazy. My servers are like, 
you know, they're cleaning up the tables and they're having to bring out like almost like shop vacs to get up all the crumbs. <laughs> so I started cutting the biscuit in half. We would pop it in the oven and toast it up a little bit. And then get that bite with that jam. Like we do a jalapeno cheddar that you have like a cane syrup butter. Um, and then like a green tomato jalapeno jam. And it's served with our homemade dill pickles. And it's, have that on there to get a, it's an amazing bite. You know, uh, we have a smoked bacon onion jam, spiced pecan maple butter that goes with our truffle smoked gouda biscuits. Uh, we've done plantain ginger uh, with coconut guava jam and, um, and orange blossom honey butter. So it's a, it's, a, it's a really unique, no one's done it, you know what I mean? Yeah. So we made it fun. And so the, 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 the drop biscuit is, is very, again, it works out really well. And you can take these biscuits and make them ahead of time. You can cool them down, freeze them, and then when you, need, when you want to enjoy it with the family, you can just pull them out. You can either just let them slack out overnight, or you can pop them in the oven, refresh them, and, and, they're, and, they're, and they're great. Uh, so, yeah, so that's, that's our technique with those biscuits. Yeah. That's right. Buy lots of biscuits, put them in your freezer. Come back, buy lots of biscuits, put them in your freezer. <laughs> uh, you know, as a restaurant guy, I, I, love, I love you sharing uh, what it's like when you see the dining room and those concerns. But... From my perspective, the drop biscuit and what you're talking about is a really great business. Um, you know, we, we, we do the laminate, and it is somebody standing at a table for hours and hours a day. Um, and that's a lot of labor, you know? It's a lot of, it's a lot of labor. Um, we're able to, like my restaurant, we have my chef, my sous chef, and then literally we have a, te a temporary cook that comes in. Um, when we're in season, then you have a full-time cook and then a couple of dishwashers, that's it. So they're able to manage, and my chefs, won't, don't, they don't necessarily work more than 55 hours a week. You know, so I give them a good balance of quality of life. The workload is very specific because I did it. I was the one that was doing it, and I wanted to make sure I handed the keys off to someone that they can have a good balance of quality of life. They make a good increase every year. And, and, and so I, you know, as, we, as I like to use the saying, like, if, if, you know, as the business eats, we all eat. You know, and so as we do well, we all do well. And that's why we, we don't have the turnover, um, definitely not in the kitchen um, that we do. I mean, even our servers, they're, they're counter servers. They make 11 $12 an hour, plus they pull tips. Yeah. Whereas normally you're like six eighty seven dollars $7. Um, and so they're getting, cause we already know where it's coming in the future. So I've been already anticipating that. So they have no reason to go anywhere else. Yeah. 